Hello, everyone. Welcome to the um, joining us today for day one of the annual DBE workshop and networking summit. If you are attending the Labor Challenges and Solutions Workshop, you are in the right place. My name is Leah Collins Voracek, and I'm the Director for the Office of Business Opportunity and Equity Compliance, um, which is in WSTA and houses the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions, I ask that you please type in to the Q&A chat box, and I'll read the questions towards the end of the session. Um, I already provided a link to this session's evaluation, and I do ask that you take a few minutes to complete it before going to your next agenda session. So your feedback is re really important to us, so please um, share your perspectives about the information that you've heard from this session today. Just want to kind of give you another uh, brief overview of today's session, and I'd like to introduce um, the uh, moderator of the session as well as the panel members. Um, as far as what this session is all about, workforce challenges continue to remain one of the single most threats to the construction industry. Challenges exist in today's workforce regarding recruiting, retaining quality employees, and attracting individuals from minority and underrepresented groups. To meet the needs of both the future and today in construction, companies need robust workforce development and management strategies that can attract, train, and retain and promote the workers needed to construct and maintain the highway infrastructure today and into the future. This workshop will feature a roundtable panel discussion of the challenges and search for labor shortages, solutions. Um, I'd like to introduce to you your moderator, Lenise McGee. Um, she is the Bureau of Job Service District Director for the Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington Counties, Wisconsin was Department of Workforce Development. Lenise, wait, please, so everyone can see who you are. Great. Joshua Johnson is a Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Technical Assistance Center of Excellence for Jobs for the Future, Josh. Tracy Griffin is a Human Resource Outreach Manager for the Wabat Group, Tracy. So everyone can see Tracy, great. John Anderson is the Southeast Regional Director for the Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership. We also know as WRTP Big Step, John. Jennifer Marks is the Director of Operations for Forward Services, Jennifer. Uh, Dwayne Sampson, he is a former trans program graduate. He currently works for a Langing uh, Roofing Company, and he's a sheet metal worker. And Jose, hey, there he thanks, Dwayne. And then Jose Galvin is with Employ Milwaukee, um, and he is a manager of business service program operations. So, Lenise, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Leah. Um, Thank you, everyone, for being here. I am so um dive into this conversation. Build back strong, right? That's what this is all about today. And I am guaranteeing that this conversation is going to help direct that. And the reason why I'm so excited about this is because this is all about collaboration, right? We know that collaboration is the vehicle that will get us to that destination of building back strong, a strong workforce, right? And so make sure that you grab your pens and papers so that you can take notes. Also, we invite you not just to observe today, we want you to contribute to the conversation. We want you to use that chat box. We want you to write any resources that you may have. We want you to also share things that you may, may know of. Also, ask questions. Ask Ask those questions so that we can pull together collaboratively and come up with some solutions. One thing that I do understand is that we understand that knowledge is in the space, right? Knowledge is in the space. So that's not just the panel. That is everyone that is joining us today. So we definitely want to hear from you. Saying that, I'm going to go right into the questions. Um, as Leah has stated, I am in the workforce development area. Um, I work in a job center, so I am very aware and I hear about a lot of the challenges that employers are facing today. 
Um, some things could be with communication. It also could just be the reality of this, this uncertain world that we live in. I've heard people talk about technology challenges, innovation. So Tracy, this question is directed to you. What are the two top challenges related to your workforce? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Lenise. When you said to pick two, that was tough. Um, but really, when we take a look at what we see coming with our company, we don't have an issue getting applicants. So when people are saying they're not getting applicants, I don't. we don't have that issue. The, the challenge we have is getting skilled workers and workers with very specific skill set for the type of work we do. That, that's one area that is a challenge. The other is candidates, and this could be um, entry level or semi-skilled skilled coming into the industry, not being prepared for the heavy highway industry. And that could mean not having transportation. Um, you know, we've talked about barriers before, not having transportation, um, not having the driver's license or not, something as basic as not understanding the hours that we work, um, the type of work we do. And uh, the, the other thing that ties into that as we're, we're recruiting candidates and pulling them into our company, candidates are changing their mind at the last minute. Um, they're finding a more appealing um, job than a career in the heavy highway industry. So what we found is that we have to uh, be a little more exciting than we have in the past with what we do. Those would, would be the two, Lenise. Thank you so much. And we may um, circle back to that if we have time, because you shared a lot of um, interesting things. And um, we would like to see if you have some solutions to address those needs. So my experience um, has taught me the importance of open communication, right? And if we listen just as much as we speak, we might learn something, right? We create this unique opportunity to grow. So we have the employer's right. We have the employees and we even have the prospective job seekers. They all have their own perspective of what is needed, what is missing and what we should do. And we're very, very um, grateful today that we have Mr. Duane with us because he is in his fourth year as a sheet metal apprentice. And from that, he can share his perspective on what are the two top challenges that you experienced when you entered into the industry? Um, for me personally, or just over, I would say for me personally, it was the hours, like Tracy said, and also it wasn't so much transportation, but it was adapting to a new world. Um, you know, now I'm in a, I'm in a different world that I'm used to where I was, I was working at pick and save or, or Walmart. Now I'm in a career, career environment where these guys and these ladies have, you know, different mindsets and able to teach and learn from their, their whole mindset is structured differently than somebody who has a, just a job and not career. There's room for growth in my industry. And I don't know if that answered it exactly, but for me, that's what it was. Okay. Thank you, Dwayne. And as you um, <clears throat> entered into this field with your um, other colleagues, what were some things that they shared with you that as you guys were just maybe having lunch together or things, what are some challenges that you heard them stating that they had entering into the industry? A lot of it was the, um, the being willing to, because, okay, so we're in the construction, obviously, you know, is, and these guys were brought up from, generations to other generations where they were brought up were more tougher i want to say can't be so i don't want to sound mean or not but sensitive because the way they're teaching me they're teaching me that they're they're stuck in their ways i want to say in a sense or they're brought up to be tougher so they're teaching me it's a little bit harder so a lot of the guys were you know brought up or he said this or he said that or he he did this, he did that, but it's just their way of showing that they actually do keep genuinely care and their their love, their love for you, because they want they teach you. If they didn't care, they wouldn't teach you with their their skill set and their trade, their trade and their craft. It's just that was one, and then also well, it was hours. You know, it's just it's a lot because right now we're starting to get to my peak season where we're going to pick back up when I was instead of going from six four hour days or average of eight to nine hour days, maybe Saturdays depending on the job site just so much hours but after a while you get used to waking up at four or five driving coming to work meeting your guys 
and bringing that, you know, good aura here, making them laugh. Because I am the youngest so far. I try to bring that good youth energy here to every job that I'm working with when I work with the guys. Thank you, Dwayne. You said a lot, and um, I'm hoping um, those that are hiring and looking to, to build their pipeline are, are kind of listening again to both perspectives, because as employers, we have our perspective of what we're with the challenges we face, and then those that are coming into the industry, um, what I just kept hearing um, as you were talking was mindset. A lot of things are the mindset. And how do we work yes. with that as employers? How do we work with some of those soft skills, getting used to getting up early, getting used to a flexible schedule, some of those things. So if we can, uh, as employers, look at from that perspective, what can we do <clears throat> so that we're constantly building that? And even communication styles, you were, you were sharing something about um, how some of them are kind of stuck in their ways and stuck with how they think. And so like, how do we, we, we handle that and really understand you're saying they say that cause they care or they, so just yeah. really having an understanding of different people's experiences and understanding mm -hmm. from that, then that's how we might can communicate to really grow. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And no so problem. now, now I'm just going to keep moving right along. Um, and not all like trying to oh go ahead Dwayne I'm sorry I'm sorry yeah not to interrupt you I did I am on a job sorry and I'm currently at work I told him I was gonna take a 15 I'm helping a journeyman we're doing this Ronald McDonald house I'm helping a journeyman currently and I was gonna say I won't be I can't stay long but I'll stay another five ten minutes you needed me another five ten minutes if you still need me here okay stay as long as you can we definitely would okay. love to continue to hear your no perspective okay thank mm -hmm. you thank you so much and so um, something that was mentioned early by Tracy was um, that actually she, she gets a lot of applicants to apply, but it's once they're in that pipeline, there's other barriers that that is happening. And we all if, if you're if you if you are running a business, if you are in the HR space, you don't even have to be in the HR space. If you just look at any job board, you see that the struggle is real right now. Um, a lot of companies have been struggling filling open jobs. And then there's just different reasons, right? As Tracy had mentioned, transportation, the hours, um, the mindset, things of that nature. I also know like childcare, there's so much more. So right now, I kind of want to shift it to focus on some solution base um, with some of those challenges or others that haven't been mentioned. And so um, Tracy, Jose, Jennifer, John, and Joshua all of you almost if you can answer this question what are you doing to address those challenges and work shortage so we can start with tracy sure well what i'll do so we have lots of things we're doing i, I want to point the partners on this call i work with them they are my uh go-to uh for solutions um, they, it's really important that employers know what their resources are. And I'm very lucky to have a great partner in forward services, WRTP Big Step and uh, Employee Milwaukee. That's where you go, right? And um, having Josh's knowledge. And so what we're doing specifically at Walbeck Group, um, I'm going to list some things and feel free for, for the others jump in because I know I'm working with some of you on these. Um, a big one for our company is, is being very active in the high school and that ties into developing a direct pipeline um, into pre-apprenticeship programs, um, which Josh was significant in getting certified pre-apprenticeship programs, getting people ready for the industry. Our entry-level um, recruitment, our first go-to when we're hiring entry-level, it's going to be uh, two of the people on the call, Forward Service and WRTP Big Step, um, to hire road-building trans grads that go through their training program. So when we're talking about not being ready for the industry, not knowing what it's about, we're counting on our partners to help get that, that group, that population ready. And, and by group of population, anyone who isn't familiar with road building, but especially people who don't have access to, to that type of information. And one of the things we're doing for our company is working directly with uh, Employ Milwaukee, the workforce board, we're developing a scholarship in partnership with them. Um, we're going to, and, and this is tied to us helping retain because we always talk about getting candidates. We don't talk about the retention, especially of diversity and, and increasing diversity. We've um, signed an MOU with Employee Milwaukee and we're gonna be offering 
um, dollars towards diverse candidates that graduate from the um, road building trans classes. Um, there'll be a selection process and we're going to help them make it through their apprenticeship. Um, that, that is our goal so that we can help retain them when barriers come up. Um, and, and it may cover supplies that the, the workforce boards don't. That's a big one for us. We also developed a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club to recruit diverse candidates on the professional side uh, with their college readiness program. And we're actively doing intentional things to get that pipeline of people in. Collaboration, Lenise, you mentioned collaboration and communication. That's a big one. And one of the things our HR team is having to do, um, and we always have done, but it's about doing things differently now. The workforce is changing. And what Dwayne said, um, he, he made a point and to stress on that is communication is super important. How someone may talk to somebody younger and older and how we communicate via text, via phone, email. How are we making sure we're not losing the candidate that's there that just doesn't, so they don't move on to another employer. So our HR team has been extraordinary in the follow-up and the connecting to people coming in to be more engaging. The other thing we're doing, and, and I think a lot of people are doing this, is offering sign-on bonuses. Um, and I don't think that's a, a solution, uh, an overall solution, but it, it's a enticing uh, thing to do right now. So those are some of the things we're doing, and, and I'm gonna throw it to, to my partners here on the call to jump in and answer their, their solutions. Jose, do you wanna go ahead and share? Yeah, sure. Um, so obviously with Employment Milwaukee, we're the Workforce Development Board for Milwaukee County. So we partner with all the local workforce boards. So we have a slightly different role in, in the sense in that uh, we coordinate with a lot of the organizations in these areas to help them find uh, the talent that they need to train so that they can then get them prepared for employers and vice versa working with employers to understand what the industry needs and bring that information back to our, to our organizations to get them all geared up and understand what it is. Um, some of the things that we're looking at are, are it's a two-way street, number one. It's not just the, the job seeker, but it's also the employer, the potential apprentice. And doing our best to educate both sides of what it is that the industry needs, wants, and expects, but also give them a, a realistic answer as to what, what the approaches are, what the strategies are, and some of the things that they may want to consider. Um, the organizations on this call, um, the Great TP and Forward, are great organizations. They've been around for a while. They're, they're great at what they do. Uh, we as a workforce board are there to support them and other programs, um, trying to find ways to maybe provide some innovation, some strategies. Um, one of the challenges that we're having as far as an overall is people are busy. Um, I'm sure Dwayne, he was working at Pick and Save, and he needed to find time to get to the training at the WITP Big Step, get to the tutor, whatever it was. And he did this, you know, on his time and his 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 wallet. So some of the things that we're looking to do as a workforce is maybe find a way to provide stipends, more assistance, more support services in line to what the Wallbreakers group is doing. They're doing it on the end. When they get to them, we're trying to get them to get there first and provide the support services they need to get there. So you know, partnering with um, different organizations for transportation solutions. While we are somewhat limited, it doesn't stop us from having those conversations and making sure that people are aware of the limitations of transportation, limitations as to what are some of the challenges and understanding that. Another approach is um, helping everyone understand, especially now with COVID-19, uh, where people are coming from and how how they react to different different scenarios. Dwayne brought up the old the old tried and to, you know, well, that's the way we do it. You know, it's it's a hard fact. It's the way it's done. Um, it, that's how I was taught. And and that's fine and dandy, but sometimes people from other situations, irregardless of the culture, economics, whatever, they have things in their background that sometimes they don't react to that well. So one of the pushes yes. that we're taking is to do more information and education on trauma informed care. You know, why do people react certain ways? Um, why is it that, you know, women on the job don't 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 
survive a lot of times. What are the, what are the implications, especially in the male dominated industry? So again, trying to provide more awareness around those uh, and not just for the employers, but for the participants as well. Hey, I, I, I hear what you're saying and how you react and notice this. How can we help you prepare for that while you're in training? So when you get on the job site, you know how to deal with it. Go ahead, Dwayne. He was just saying he had to sign off to get back to work. And I'll keep going on, but I won't. So let others talk. <laughs> All right, John, you have anything to add to that? Well, I would answer uh, your question, Brian, with three points. And the three points would be recruit, train, and then support individuals to retain them. And so as far as recruiting people, we work with the city administration, the schools, uh, local Workforce Board, the Department of Workforce Development, the Bureau of Apprenticeship Standards, the Department of Correction. We work with Gateway and Waukesha County Technical Colleges, our community-based organizations, and above all else, the employers and our trade unions to really reach, do outreach and to reach people in the community. And then training as a road building trans program a provider. You know, our, the road building trans program is a nationally accredited pre-apprenticeship program with hands-on training. So we're taking the time in partnership with our industry partners and our trade unions to really expose people and give them a realistic perspective of what they can um, in for within the industry and to make those connections in real time so they can really be prepared, but know what they're gonna get into and have a transition from that learning to on the job because of course as we know apprenticeship is on the job training but there are many things that have to go before that to get a person ready and into the workforce so i can kind of tie up it because i you know as a question i'll tie it up i hated to see Dwayne lee right some of the best conversations we have are listening to apprentices and their point of view right and there's so many things i wanted to ask him and point out and so I hated to see him leave, but I, I totally understand that is the industry we live in, right? You can't, you, you don't work, you don't eat, essentially, right? So it's, uh, unfortunately, uh, he wasn't able to, to stay longer. But on a national level, you know, we're looking at those challenges and worker shortages in a couple different ways. I think that one of the main ways, John really just talked about how they are engaging with so many different partners, right? WRTP Big Stuff is already... Uh, a somewhat of an intermediary, right? It's a CBO, right? Nonprofit, right? It's it's in this is realm, and they're working to connect with everyone else. Nationally, we talk about the same thing with employers, which is we can challenge employers and say, "Hey, you're not diverse, or you're not uh, 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 addressing your 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 worker shortage um, by going out and trying to find folks, right?" And what they tell us is, "Well, who do we need to reach out to?" So it has to be one of those things where it, I can't tell Tracy that Zenith Tech is not uh, diverse. I, I'm going to have a diverse, I'm going to have a DEIA lens on everything that I talk about, uh, just to the FYI. But I can't tell Tracy she's she needs to be focused on creating inclusive registered apprenticeship programs if I don't also give Tracy the information where she can go find the workers that fit the model of the DEIA. Uh, that we're looking for. So I think it has to be it has to be a conversation back and forth. Too many times we put the onus on the employers to say, hey, you all need to do this. And how do we help them? Or, or and, and they say, well, how can you help us? And meantime, it's like, we'll just figure it out. So I think, you know, as we look at that, addressing those challenges are informing those employers who they can get in contact with as well and making that warm connection, not just giving them a flyer, like sometimes organizations do to individuals of, oh, you're interested in this, here's a flyer, go find out. We have to be connectors. We have to make that warm connection to those employers and those area or those folks who have the population or the talent pipeline that they need. Thank you, Joshua. Jennifer, we would love to hear your voice on the matter of solutions. Yeah, I think um, John did a great job kind of explaining the trans program. I just probably would have a couple um, things to add to that. Um, if you ask our trans coordinators, one of the most important things we offer, it's the um, professional development package and just kind of all those soft skills um, pieces. And kind of going back to what Duane said about hours and kind of adapting to that new world. 
Um, we really focus on time management. We focus on financial literacy so they can get familiar with kind of this new world, which is road construction industry. Um, throughout our six week training, which is normally about 180 hours, we do have um, past grads come in as well as contractors so that they can get an idea of what work really is gonna look like for them in the industry. Um, we make sure it's kind of this wraparound services um, so that you know their family's aware too of what they can expect. You know the the um, significant other and the children at home. Um, there's going to be a change to kind of that household dynamic with you know the hours that are um, required for this industry. So we really want them to be prepared so that we're not just graduating bodies. We're graduating people that are ready for the industry and meeting kind of those skilled trade needs that the contractors have. Um, so we also, you know, really focus on providing supportive services and, you know, co-enrolling with several partners or, you know, our internal programs so we can help with gas vouchers. So it makes that six weeks, you know, something that they can participate in. We're helping with, you know, work boots, um, all the, the costs for when they get, you know, that position. I'm really excited to hear about, you know, the discussions about the stipends and scholarships. That's one area that has been really a focus of ours is, you know, we can get people into the class, but life happens during those six weeks that that scholarship and those stipends really would help, um, I think, increase the pipe pipeline that's coming out of our trans programs. Wow, this has been a um, very rich discussion. You guys have shared so many solutions. Um, but I would like, I want to do a follow up question really quickly to those that may be listening today. Um, and although we may not know each, um, each person listening or what exactly their needs are. I want you to share just one resource or one one organization or something they should reach out to that really helps you shift. Um, I love the way John has said they focus on recruit, train, and support. So if someone is looking for a resource, for um, training or supporting their current staff, what is one resource or one organization or something that you would um, advise people to reach out and find out more information if it might assist them as they are building their pipeline? And whoever feels led to share first. Well, Lanisa, if I, I just would like to say, and it, it, Jennifer prompted this as she was talking about the importance of the the resources and the support because life happens. Sometimes employers don't care that life happens. I mean, that's an honest, honest thing. It's being recorded, Eve. It's true um, because there's there's a job to be done. And what's really important is understanding that life does happen and that that employee can talk to someone to let them know, or to the employer, to let them know that something's happening. Um, what happened here, this was a couple of years ago, one of our female workers um, was struggling. She had some personal things going on. I wasn't aware of any of this. What happened was our superintendent was giving her gas money and trying to help her out because he didn't want to lose her, but he didn't know what to do. And he finally, a light bulb went off and he said, let me ask Tracy. And he gave me a call. Um, I connected with this person and, and this woman had gone through the road building trans class and I was able to make one phone call to say we have someone we don't want to lose here are the things she's going through I don't want to get into that that she needs to talk to you how can we help her so that we can keep her she's successful she's safe and within minutes that connection was made and it goes back to what Josh said being connectors having the conversation knowing who that resource and support is we still have this this woman retained. She's a journey worker with us. And I, I use that as, as an example of a perfect model of success and partnership and collaboration. You know, there's the recruit, um, there's the train, there's the support, which leads to retention. And we have to remember that retention is critical for, for the Dwayne's that are in the industry and then us, the employer. Right. Good. Yeah, Tracy, yeah, that's a, a great example. And I just add that we have a contractor in the Fox Valley um, who actually have created dream manager positions outside of their HR department and outside of the supervisors that really work one on one with, 
um, employees and look at kind of what their dreams are and what their aspirations are. Um, and they've seen a significant increase in their retention because it's really investing in the person um, and allowing them to, you know, be in the industry that is, um, you know, so consuming of, you know, their life, but they still are able to kind of identify as that person outside of the job um, with the company that they work for. So it's a really neat model. Yeah, I would add that, you know, to kind of touch on Dwayne's point of one of the things he mentioned was was the most um, instant for him was transitioning into the workforce and being, you know, our, our industry being so different from other industries. Um, you know, it's been stated statistically that the highest rate of drop off of apprentices, um, be the minorities or women, is within the first two years. So I would encourage all of the in the employers to actively maybe start a mentoring group, uh, identify mm -hmm. someone from your workforce, a uh, project manager, a journey level worker who has a vested interest in seeing individuals be successful and just be mindful of the, you know, the differences because the work is the work and, and we all, that's the same, but we're all individuals. And so if you'd approach it from a human aspect, I think you'll reap more rewards and that will net you greater retention. And, and, and I just, you know, to just piggyback real quickly, Anise, before you move on to the question, um, to the next question, I don't know if I was uh, pegged for this one, but I, I, I just wanted to say, you know, John, you just said it perfectly, which is we have to look at the humanness of this. And that is something, obviously, as the world continues to evolve, the workforce evolves, you know, employers really have to start addressing and looking at things on a one-to-one -one basis. And like Tracy said, there was a young woman who was experiencing whatever issues that she was facing. And 15 years ago, they would have just ran her off the job site, right? They would have said, mm -hmm. hey, if you can't be here on time or if you can't do this and you can't leave, they would have just basically said, this isn't the, this isn't the career mm -hmm. for you. Yep. Right. And so whether right, wrong or indifferent, we are at a time now where employers don't have that ability to do that anymore because mm -hmm. they can't run anybody off of a job site because they need work to get done. But that's not to say that they can't make that job site uncomfortable for that person. And to make them think, you know, Leah, I, Leah laughs at this. And I know there was one of these when we talk about making constructive attractive that I'll go a little farther in depth. But as an employer, we have to think and look at it and say, what can I do to really help support this person? Once again, it's being the connectors. It's getting connected to the workforce board. Typically, the workforce board has those support services. Right? Mm -hmm. If they don't, then somebody else will. One of the really good things uh, uh, in my previous role as uh, state director in Wisconsin Apprenticeship, we created an AAEEO outreach handbook for the whole state that is broken up and it's available on their website. It's broken up by technical college districts. The, the, the best thing about that is for employers in those districts, if they're saying, hey, I have an employee that's struggling with this, here you go. Here's a list of resources in that area. Right? It's just getting connected and getting folks plugged in. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, that was a bonus question, Josh. So you were pegged for it and you didn't know it. Um, you guys provided a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, great information. And, and I'm, I'm just going to close with that, with saying, if you're listening and you're not sure where to start, start with your workforce development boards, as Josh mentioned. Um, you can definitely reach out to um, DWD, Department of Workforce Development, but those entities will be able to <clears throat> make those appropriate connections for you if you're unsure. Who, who do I go to? I have this concern. I have this issue. I'm having issue with recruiting or retaining or, or the support. Um, they, they definitely will be more helpful than, than maybe, you know, um, if you have not utilized those resources yet. So that is a great starting point. I appreciate all of your input. Um, now we talked a lot about solutions and things of that nature. I want to shift the conversation a little bit and I want to focus on your outreach and, and branding and marketing strategies. And so um, Jose, Tracy and, and Josh, and if someone else feels led to share, um, how do you make a career in construction look attractive, attracting people to actually come into that industry? So if you don't mind, I just want to kick this off because this is, you know, me and Leah were at an event and, and I tapped her and we laugh, right? For those, for Tracy and any other employers on the line, I want you to really think about how do you, how do you talk to individuals about your industry? 
what words do you use? Words have power, and we've learned that, right? I always get a kick out of when somebody talks about construction, what is the number one word that they use? It's hard work. Listen, 44 years old, if you come and tell me something's hard, I don't know if I really want to do it, right? But if you tell me something, there's challenges, there's rewards. If you say there's pride, like we have to change how we talk about the construction industry, especially when we look at diving into underrepresented populations. Let me tell you why, right? Underrepresented populations have historically been disenfranchised in the workforce in general. And when you go and tell them this is construction is going to be hard work, let me tell you what they're thinking. They're already trying to single me out and make sure that I don't come into the industry. That is the first thing that they think when they hear the word hard is they, they don't want me over here because they're trying to now convince me why I shouldn't get involved. So as employers, it is inherent, and we, we talk about this nationally, it is inherent that you change the way you talk about the industry. You yeah. cannot talk about the industry in terms that are that will make somebody pause, especially if you're trying to recruit Gen Z. Let me tell you, I got two Gen Z kids, a bunch of Gen Z kids in my house, and if I tell them something's hard, they look at me like, yeah, I don't think I really want to do that. Or, or dirty. Or dirty. Um, <laughs> it's not dirty. Or it's really hot. You're going to get sweaty. Yeah. It's, it, you, <laughs> when, when you, and, and, and while those are expectations, those shouldn't be the lead off, right? Like if you're dating somebody and you meet somebody, you don't lead <laughs> off with, I've been divorced five times, just letting you know. No, that's something once they, you know, they decide if they really like you and this relationship is going to go forward. And maybe something that you talk about, right? But you well, don't. Josh, need... Now I know what I've been doing wrong. I'm coming to you for <laughs> advice. <laughs> but you you don't lead off with those things that might you know somebody might take pause to. But you lead off with the rewarding part, and 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 we even have to be careful about talking about the pay because Gen Z does not care about pay. They will go work for free and take a bus everywhere, or walk or ride a bike. They're not worried about making eighty thousand dollars a year. While it is fantastic, that's not their focus. So we have to change how we talk about industry, just as we had to change how we talk about apprenticeship in general. And, and, and that way you start to attract those other populations. Sorry, I just had to say that because that is a huge part of what I'm doing when, when I talk to employers and when I when I present about how do we market things differently. And but that Josh, is really good. Josh, yeah. You said words have power, right? Words have power, but so do visuals. So one of the things we need to change, and, and Josh, we talked about this when we were on the council together, right, um, is changing the marketing material. If you're trying to recruit females, you don't have um, old white men at a table no. trying to get, I, I, you know, that's probably not the best way to say it, but it's true. It's true. If you're trying to recruit, re, uh, recruit younger, diverse candidates, you have to like if they see it they can be it right so your visuals on your marketing we're really working hard on doing um apprenticeship videos and diverse marketing so that when i'm out and our company's out that people see someone who looks like them there's someone there that they can talk to they're gonna a female is going to stop and ask questions to a female that she is not going to ask to somebody who, who is very knowledgeable and and has the the whole knowledge of the industry they're going to pass them by so i want to josh absolutely everything you said and you know i'm i'm with you on that but then the visuals have to go with that um and when you have that combination it changes it you know when people go in the military we don't sit out and talk about hey come in the military you're gonna you could get shot up you know so to josh's point you don't want to start out by, by talking about the bad thing. What are the good things? Do you like to move around on the job? Do you, do you like to meet different people? Do you like to problem solve? Where, you know, mm -hmm. showing that you're using this along with this um, and that, you know, the immediate gratification that comes from the new generation, that, that there is something to be said about that. What is gratifying to them? Mm -hmm. That's what we have to communicate. And to piggyback just real quickly, John, before you jump in there, I wanted to say visual optics are so important. And, and Tracy, as you know, on the council, you know, I commissioned one of the, the video, the Wisconsin apprenticeship video, which shows women and minorities as apprentices. 
something that we've never done before, right? We've always just talked about, but I wanted it visual. That was the most important thing was visual. I want people to see this. I want them to see the billboards. I want them to see the buses. I want them to see themselves in here. And it was funny because there was a night I was up at two o'clock in the morning smoking a cigar. We were out, right? And I'm watching, it was a commercial that came on and it blew me away. Very well-known company in Wisconsin, in the Southeast area. And they were advertising for truck drivers and for those to load the trucks. The first image was the truck driver, white male, make $100,000. The second image, women and minorities loading the trucks with forklifts, making $50,000. Companies don't think about that imagery. And for me, sitting there and to catch that. Now, you sure, that's my expertise, right? Diversity and equity and inclusion. But the normal person would also catch that. They would also see the imagery and say, oh, so I can't drive a truck, but I could go and load the trucks because that's where everybody that looks like me. So it really is important. Optics are so vitally important in this day and age. Sorry, John. No, the problem, I was actually just going to piggyback on what you both said and just say they're being literal audience members. Here's one of our recruitment flyers for our road building. It has an ass, a happy looking African-American gentleman. Here's a flyer for a women in a trades event. Here's a very happy looking female who's working in the construction industry. If you wanna diversify, if you wanna draw these people in, that visual, words have power, but visually, we are, are visual creatures, you know? We are drawn to what we see and we can be slightly judgmental. So sometimes we interpret with our eyes, you know, prior to, to researching and finding more. And so if your presentation is one that is off-putting, even if you know, you've got the best thing, you're paying a hundred million dollars, but if it looks horrible or it doesn't represent the people you're trying to attract, they're gonna turn away from it. So I just wanted to kind of say that what, what Tracy and Josh are saying, they're not, you know, uh, uh, theoretical statements, they're literal, they're, you know, these are the things you want to apply to your strategies. Wow, this has been really, really great conversation. Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry, I was just going to add that um, you know, Forward Service Corporation has recently changed all of our trans marketing material to um, include graduate pictures instead of just the normal stock photos. And we've seen a lot of success in that. I think we know that there's a power in social media. And what better way for a trans grad to talk about a program that really benefited them than to have a flyer with their face on it on their social media page. And um, it, it goes a lot further. We're touching a lot more people with having our, our graduate pictures in there. Um, and as a company too, like on our Facebook page, we're highlighting our staff and just saying like what their experience has been in the program. So I think that, you know, as a training provider, we're trying to make that change, but also contractors, you know, taking advantage of social media and Facebook pages and, you know, highlighting, you know, different employees that are diverse, um, I think is so important. That's really good. And they're more likely to share if their face is on it too. Um, and Josh, you mentioned something, just being creative with, with the billboard and um, the bus, the, the bus and things like that, where, where people are going to be at um, advertising in those spaces. And, and I think you guys just said it so well, you have to, they have to see it before they see themselves. And so how important is that? And how intentional are you on that? And something else, Josh, that you said about the language, which I think is so important that um, employers spend time on the language, but not only that, working with the marketing company, but then working with your internal staff on what the language is, because they will refer people. People will want to work because of how they talk about it. So it's not just important for the managers and marketing, but how are you creating that culture of language within the whole body of, of your, your establishment? Um, Agreed. Jose, did you want to add anything before I go? To yeah, the I, I do want to add something. So everything that's said is spot on. You know, the message has to be diversified. You have to show it. You have to have the people available in the industry that reflect the populations you're trying to recruit and entice. Um, but you also have to get it out there. And it's not and not just a flyer. I mean, especially um, I'm an old guy. I'm 55 years old. So I've gone through seen computers that were the size of a house to now it's, you know, on my, on my wrist. So the methods and the ways of delivering the message have changed as well. And if you're not texting... If you're not tweet, tweeting, if you're not 
doing all the other ings, <laughs> um, the message is not going to get out there. And it needs to be constantly refreshed and it needs to be, you know, updated on a regular basis. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge that, that the industry has, has always had a hard time overcoming because the industry as a whole hasn't been very, very forthcoming, not forthcoming, very good about marketing itself in a way and, and investing in that investment as well. That's the key as well. Uh, we as a workforce board, we struggle with it, but we, we are constantly looking how can we get the message out there that resonates and and not and like you said you share the message with people of different ages different cultures different backgrounds to see how it resonates with them and you constantly and you and just because you did it once doesn't mean you you did it you're done you got to keep doing it so um th those are those are a couple of the key things about it i mean and also just the way you message the, the industry and the opportunities that the, you mean again old school had as you come out with why you shouldn't do it well you, here's why you should do it um especially for a lot of younger generations i mean i got a 17 year old at home and i got a 20 year old and my approach to them about the industry has always been it's a great career and a great opportunity that provides you the opportunity to a work for someone or go into business for yourself you know you have the opportunity to travel the world you literally do so you know the messaging out there needs to needs needs to highlight those 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 avenues those strong points not just the weak points i mean you talk about them later on but don't gloss over but again get the message out there constantly get it out there and updated um and whenever possible um don't rely on one source so you know we rely on all of our partners uh to share the message we post it on our multi multi forms and multimedia forms and platforms but you know we can't rely on that on, on just us getting the message out we have to get it out to everyone else and make sure they get it that is so good can i give a quick 10 seconds lanice also for employers that are listening uh or th that may hear this at some point look at your board of directors mm -hmm. look at your management look at those individuals that your workforce reports to if they are if they do not represent any any type of diversity, diversity. Mm -hmm. trust and believe that you are going to struggle to get in diverse individuals into your organization. So it's sometimes, and, and not even sometimes, as an organization, you have to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And you have to look and say, our board of directors is all white men. Like, fine, that's how it's been forever. It's time to shake it up and change it. Because if we can't have at the top, representation then at the bottom you will have zero representation or you will have zero faith that those individuals that do come in will actually progress and grow within your organization i just want to piggyback off that though not just the employers the wills have to look at our training providers and when you have those individuals in your in your clutches and, and you're trying to teach them the industry and have that technical aptitude but also working on the mental aptitude of it and the messaging that they're getting out there and and what they're going to encounter and that it's not always the negative it's just the way it is doesn't make it right but this is how you you know provide them with the coping skills how to overcome some of those things and and, and again uh, we talked about you know who others should reach out to it's not just one person it's multiple people and it's on a regular basis as well jennifer you wanted to say something no, that's okay. Sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> that's okay. This is this has been really, really great dialogue, and I I just wanted to add, basically, Joshua, you said it. Um, even when you're developing marketing, whatever you're doing, look at the people who are doing that. If I'm trying to get women or, or younger people or whatever, and I don't have their voice at the table, <clears throat> that that should rise a concern of. I need their voice at the table so that we can know how to reach them. And so I know we are closing to time and I want to make sure that if there were any questions in the chat, Leah. Yeah. So Lenise, what I'd like to do, I think there, you know, we have about 11 minutes left here and boy, this conversation has just been um, incredibly, I think just uh, impactful. It really has been. Uh, and I hope that the attendees 
are getting a lot of great information too. I know that I am. We do have one question that was for Dwayne, but I am going to ask John Anderson if he'll be able to answer or because he knows uh, Dwayne and worked with Dwayne closely for a number of years. And then Lenise, um, you're welcome to have the panel members give like some uh, closing remarks before mm -hmm. uh, we end because we have some time since I only see one question in the chat. The question I again will pose to John Anderson um, and it was for Duane. What attracted you to the to this work, and would you recommend it to other young people that were in a similar line of work that you were in before? So thank you. Um, so knowing Duane for quite some time, um, Duane was attending uh, Bradley Tech, which is a, a technical oriented high school in Milwaukee. Um, and much of the work we do is going into the school system and working with individuals at a young age. And so at, at a somewhat young age, um, we were able to connect with Dwayne and give him exposure. And I think it was that exposure and his opportunities to try a few different things, to try carpentry, to try sheet metal, to allowed him to really visualize and actualize that this was something tangible that he could do. And from there, he just followed through with us, followed the steps, let us lead and guide and direct him. And he has gone to where he is today. Um, as far as um, would he recommend it to others? He does. Dwayne is an advocate. He's in his community. He's on social media. He's Facebook, LinkedIn. He um, goes out to the schools and gives speeches, you know, when he can get off of work. Um, because he's seeing how life-changing this has been for him and how there still needs to be more, uh, more individuals that look like him and don't look like him, that there's so much room in this industry and it's growing. So um, I can speak on his behalf and say that, yes, um, he is a strong advocate for getting more individuals into the skilled trades. And one of the things that was key was getting to him at a young age. Thank you. All right, so before we um, close out, um, Josh, really quickly, I just want to ask, because we talked a little bit about this, and I think it's, it's just important if you can quickly address this about um, having a diverse um, diversity. Um, and you, you mentioned making sure that the board is diverse. Is there any other tip that you would provide to people who are trying to make sure that their workforce is inclusive? You know, if you're looking at, so, here I'm gonna I'm gonna put a plug in here for JFF, right? That's, that's who I work for. So I'm gonna throw this plug in there. If you are trying to build a inclusive registered apprenticeship programs, no matter where you are in the country, you can reach out to us or me directly, uh, and and I can get connected with my team or our nine partners that we have nationally that can have those discussions to look at what <clears throat> your makeup is, how your process to bring in individuals how your process for growing individuals once they're in your organization, we can really look at how, how to help you with those processes. The other part of it though really is, I said it in, in my last comment is, employers really have to be honest with themselves. Unfortunately, many employers are not honest when they look across their board or look across their management because they say these famous words and, and many of us on the call who have been disenfranchised in the workforce, we hear the words, I hired the best possible person, right? I hired the most qualified person. Well, you can't just always hire the most qualified person when it's in, in certain instances. You have to find a way to cultivate those individuals who are already in your organization to make them qualified, right? And many times we don't do that as, as employers. We don't look at it from that perspective. And, you know, I encourage all employers really understand that, we know this. We've been talking about this for years. There are more people that are leaving your workforce every day than there are entering your workforce. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to get very, very savvy on how to attract individuals to your companies and understand that not every, you know, minority is a monolith, right? Everyone operates differently. Tap into those organizations to get assistance. Tap into your workforce boards. Tap into the workforce the Department of Workforce Development. Find out what it is those supports are that you can use to help build that workforce. 
Thank you. And so in closing, this has been amazing. Um, if you all could just give your 60 second spiel, closing remarks um, for, for the people listening today or who may watch the replay. John, we can start with you. All right. So hot off the presses, I got Dwayne on text. And as he says, what keeps him going and coming back to work is the freedom and the availability he's, cre and he's created for his life and his family. And he says to get others interested, we should keep doing the good work we're doing. Uh, I know all of you are very busy. Uh, and so I would say um, work smart, not hard. How do you do that? Reach out to Forward Services. Reach out to WRTP Big Step. You know, we are doing that work on the ground. We're doing the outreach, the recruitment, the education. You can partner with us. You can come in. We can help you to figure out ways to market, to get in front of young people, to bring in aspects of, from your company's culture into our training so people are more prepared and ready for you. So leverage what's already at the table. Don't recreate the wheel. Use us. That's my 30 seconds. Yeah, right. I would... I'm oh, sorry. I would totally agree with John and say, you know, please reach out to us. Um, I think Dwayne was a great example to have today, um, talking about kind of his experience in um, the industry. I think our, our trans grads are some of our strongest advocates. That's usually our, our best pool for recruitment. Um, we really just need contractors at the table too, helping us, you know, throughout class with some of that um, hands-on training and development. We need opportunities for um, careers that provide a ladder, not just entry-level positions. Um, I love what Wallback is doing with the scholarships and um, would welcome any opportunities to have further discussions with contractors that are interested in partnering with the trans program. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Jose? Um, so I'm with the Workforce Development Board. And if you don't know who your us is, by all means, reach out to us. <laughs> uh, we're one of 11 boards throughout the state. Uh, and we are more than happy to make that connection with whoever it is that you need. And that connection doesn't exist. Then let's work together to create that connection, to find some resources so we can get you the, the skilled trade people that you're looking for. Uh, to get you the connections that you're looking for. And then to our providers, our training providers, same thing. Use us for those resources that you're looking to help market your programs and get your programs up to get your, your graduates um, placed and employed. Uh, for employers looking for uh, resources to onboard new employees, retain employees, to train their workforce, their crew leaders to be a little bit more culturally sensitive or something like that, approach us. We may be able to come up with some creative ways to help provide some funding to help you have that happen. Thank you. With our two minutes left, um, Tracy and Josh, can you take us home, please? Sure. I, I'd like to just add that we, we've got to remember the work around changing the industry, meeting workforce needs, it has to be intentional, um, period. And training of the staff internally, especially those that manage others in the area of diversity and inclusion is so important and developing a career track for those employees that are already working mm. is important. We have to invest in our employees, the ability to change our strategy and do different to, to do things differently now than what we did before is critical. If we're not willing to change our thought process, we're not going to be successful. We've got to operate from the mentality that change and doing things differently will benefit us as an overall industry and we'll be successful. I mean, all of us who are working on this together will be successful. Thank you. And, and intentionality, Tracy, you stole my word, intentionality. The construction industry has to become intentional about its efforts to continue to recruit and more importantly, retain diverse talent. You have, it has to be intentional. There can't be by mishap, it can't be by accident. It really has to be intentional. And what that will do is it'll start to change the belief of how the construction industry operates in those underserved communities. So creating intentional uh, outreach, doing intentional marketing, being very intentional when someone is struggling in the industry. And I always say this, we can think about the 19, I believe it's 19 different occupations in construction, you know, as we think about them, whatever they are, right? You have to come together as an industry, not each individual occupation, as an industry and make it your 2022, 2023 and beyond goals to be very intentional about how you're going to tap into this truly 
untapped talent pipeline of people from underserved communities who want to work in construction. Mm. Thank you. Well said. Leah, any um, closing words? I would love to share some closing words. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel for an outstanding discussion. This is a really important conversation that we need to have and continue to have. Thank you, Jose, Tracy, John, Jennifer, and Joshua, and Lenise, outstanding job moderating this discussion. Um, Lenise not only has a workforce development background, but she's also a motivational speaker. So I thought she would be um, the perfect person to moderate this discussion, and she definitely uh, delivered so well. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please make sure in the chat there is the evaluation link. We'd love to hear feedback from you so that we know um, what improvements that we need to make to um, our workshop. Um, and also, if there's any other input that you'd like to share, share any um, positive um, feedback with us as well. And just also remember to visit the exhibitors and the lounge to network with other attendees. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you this afternoon. So goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.